good afternoon, everybody. And a very my name is Caroline Kenyon. I'm Director of Communications and Engagement at the Innovation Agency. And I'm delighted to host this big innovation conversation webinar. We're going to be talking about the NHS as an anchor institution. We're going to hear from the main author of a fantastic report from the Health Foundation about the NHS as anchor institutions, and that's Sarah Reid. And then we'll hear from Ian Stenton, who is Head of Sustainability at the newly named Liverpool University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust where work is ongoing to become an anchor institution. Now, for everyone who's um, dialed in, we, you'll see we've got an active chat box available. So please put some questions into the chat box, and we're going to answer those questions after each speaker has finished their talk. Uh, just to mention for housekeeping that everyone on the call is muted on entry. We can unmute you if you request it on the chat box, but that's just to make it as clear as possible for the speakers. Uh, right, that's it. That's the housekeeping. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Sarah Reid. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'll share my screen. Great. Um, so thanks so much for that really kind introduction. I think um, just, so just in terms of what I'm hoping to cover in my portion of the presentation, I'm going to start by just doing some scene setting about why we think this is a really important time to be having this conversation and considering the broader role that the NHS can have in a place. I'll spend plenty of time going over what we act exactly mean by the term anchor institution and what this looks like in an NHS context, drawing on some of the examples from our recent report about what this looks like in practice. And then I'll conclude with just a few words on where we see some of the greatest opportunities are for taking this forward and scaling this um, across the sector. Before I do that, just a word on the Health Foundation for those of you who might be less familiar. So we're an interesting organization in that we're both a foundation and a think tank. So a lot of what we do is directly fund um, projects on the front line to carry out and test different innovations and ways of improving the quality of healthcare. Uh, we also do a lot of our own in-house research and analysis to try to influence and inform the practice and policy environment um, so that change can happen. And we do this all with the aim of bringing about better health and health care to people in the UK. But as an organization, we started to realize that if we really are going to make the biggest difference to population health, um, we need to think a bit differently about how we act and maybe focus, um, continue to focus on health care delivery, but also focus a bit more broadly about how the NHS and public sector more broadly can be thinking about intervening more upstream and taking a bigger role in prevention and kind of preventing the the onset of illness in the first place. So it's been that shift in thinking that has been a real impetus for this work and the exploration of how the NHS can have this broader role in the place and in the communities where it's based. And just to say a few words about why we think it's really important to be considering the NHS's broader responsibility in this way. So we know from the evidence that most of what makes us healthy is actually influenced by factors outside the health system. And while it's as important as ever that we ensure that the NHS has everything it needs to provide safe, effective, and timely care, we also know that clinical care on its own is insufficient to improve population health. So if the NHS wants to do everything it can to improve the health of the communities that it serves, it needs to think beyond just this red box here at healthcare services and ways that it can intervene and have an influence in these other social determinants that you see listed here in this graph. That's important um, because of the context that we're currently in. So we're at a time where, the, for the first time in 100 years, life expectancy in England is declining. And that's in large part because of this widening health and well-being gap. The off-site statistic is that if you live in the most deprived parts of the country, you're going to die nearly a decade earlier than those who live in the least deprived parts of the country. And yes, those inequalities are driven by factors that the NHS has um, limit less control over, but it is the NHS that will will have to deal with many of those consequences as more people spend more years of their life in poor health, which creates more pressures and demands on the service. So it's, it's this context in which we're thinking, how can the NHS then intervene more directly and have a bigger difference in health inequalities that are accounting for so much of the poor health that we see in the country? And those, um, that, that gap that we see is happening at the time where NHS spending has actually been protected relative to other parts of the public sector. 
Um, and though the NHS will never be a replacement public services can do for those wider determinants, we just think it's a really important time to be thinking then, given this financial settlement, what does it mean to really maximize the value of every NHS pound for health? And what, how can we be thinking differently about how the NHS operates and functions in a community beyond the treatment and care that it provides? And so it's with that context that we that brings us to thinking about the NHS as an anchor institution. And, we, and I think this idea of an anchor institution is a really helpful framing for seeing all the different ways that the NHS has an influence in those determinants of health. So first things first, what do I mean by anchor institutions? So anchor institutions are large public sector organizations like hospitals or councils or universities that are called such because they're unlikely to relocate. They're effectively anchored in a place, hence the name. And it's by virtue of their role and their size and their scale and local populations that they have considerable assets and resources that can be channeled and leveraged in different ways to improve community health and well-being. So what does that look like in terms of the NHS? So let's start with thinking about the NHS as an employer. The NHS is the largest employer in the country. It's often the largest employer in local communities. That makes it a really critical source of employment for the um, an economic opportunity for people that it serves. And given everything we know about the link between good work and health, this is a really key way that the NHS can be improving population health beyond the treatment and services that it delivers. So it can do that by widening access to employment opportunities, particularly for populations that might be furthest from the labor market and face the greatest barriers to good quality jobs. It can also do that in the way that it actually treats and looks after the one and a half million people who work for it and how it can take every effort to maximize the health and well-being of its staff and workforce. Um, the NHS is also a big spender. So in England alone, um, trusts procure about 30 uh, billion pounds worth of goods and service every year. And um, the decisions that the NHS takes and what it buys and how it buys it can have an important impact on communities. So, for example, the NHS can make decisions about choosing to work with organizations that also help fulfill its broader social, economic, and sustainability aims um, by partnering with organizations that do more to commit to paying a living wage, that create more apprenticeship or job training opportunities in their localities, that adopt environmentally sustainable practices, a lot of influence it can have within its own supply chain. And there's also the, the way the NHS can help for economic development by shifting more of its spend locally and choosing to, to buy more goods and services within the communities where, it's, where it operates. Um, and I'll say a bit more about what that looks like and how to approach that later in the uh, presentation. Uh, the NHS is also a significant land and property owner. So, and the NHS can think about different ways that it can convert and use its properties and buildings for for health. So anything, for example, that can't be used for direct clinical care, thinking about what are the opportunities to convert that into other community assets that are really important to health, whether that be green space or parks or affordable housing, um, lots of opportunity there. And we also know that the NHS um, is a really big polluter. 40% of the public sector's um, contribution, carbon footprint comes from the NHS in the UK. One in 20 cars on the road are because of NHS travel. So anything that the NHS does to reduce that carbon footprint can have a really important impact on, envir on the environment, which we know is critical to improving health and well-being of, of, of the communities where we live. And all of this to say that in, in none of this is it's really thinking about what the NHS does in isolation. The NHS can have a much bigger impact by in the way it chooses to partner and work with other organizations and other anchors in the in the communities where it's based to kind of use their collective assets and influence and voice to drive even greater change in, in their communities. So I hope this helps illustrate a bit what we mean by the idea of anchor institutions and, and kind of gets across the idea that the NHS, simply by being in a place, can have a really important impact on health and well-being because of the, by, through virtue of its size, scale, and role in a community. But the extent of that impact and whether the impact is indeed even positive is going to come down to the decisions that the NHS can make in each of these different areas. To give you a sense of what that looks like then in practice, so let's start with thinking about the NHS as an employer. So we've been seeing um, lots of examples where 
NHS organizations have been taking um, proactive steps to really widen workforce participation and access to good work in their communities. NHS a much better place to build a career for more people. Choose an example of what that looks like. I'll take Leeds Teaching Hospital. So here the trust has been working really proactively with local council to say, you know, where are the greatest opportunities in our community to expand access to employment? So mapping out where the pockets are of deprivation, um, knowing where, what unemployment looks like in those communities, going out and doing engagement and outreach to understand what are the great, greatest barriers to facing work and how the NHS might change their practices of recruitment to kind of meet those needs. So, what they, so once they've identified where those communities are and did that engagement, they started creating a pre-employment support um, program where they directly worked with those communities to um, provide training on things like administration, on business practices, English as the second language. Um, they offered direct work placements uh, for jobs within the trust. They then gave a lot of support on those placements to then secure interviews on the other side and connect um, those members of the community to different jobs within the trust that met their skills, needs, and aspirations. And they started small and after that engagement in the first year they were able to hire 30 more people from the most deprived communities where they just weren't reaching people previously. And it wasn't until they kind of built those relationships with the tr uh, council, did this together, and kind of knew their data and where to look where they were able to make um, a much bigger impact. Thinking about procurement, so this, this is an area where the NHS perhaps has more limited flexibility since so much of procurement is decided centrally, but there are key areas where the NHS does have more choice in what it chooses to buy and how it chooses to buy it in areas like catering or hotel services and so forth. And what we've seen some places do is start to think more proactively about the idea of social value as part of those purchasing decisions. So we've seen places when, when they go out for a competitive tender process, they're actually assessing potential suppliers on the basis not only of cost and quality, but also to the extent that they help meet these broader social and economic objectives. So for example, does a supplier help create more apprenticeships in the community? Um, what, what are their terms and conditions for their workforce that can be supporting health in that way? Are they doing everything they can in their practices to be reducing their own carbon footprint, kind of using the purchasing process to drive broader change in their supply chain? Um, and, to do, and we've also seen some trusts and other NHS organizations try to think about how they might shift more of their spend locally, and to do that it's often been a real process of first understanding like what are we already buying and where is there scope to kind of work with different providers for those goods or services. And that takes doing a lot of kind of mapping and fact finding in localities to know who the suppliers are and then doing direct training and engagement with them to, to know what it takes to actually secure an NHS contract which can be a far from transparent process if you've never done that before. So kind of knowing local supplier markets and then going out and doing that engagement um, to help kind of level the playing field for smaller local organizations against multinational corporations that routinely get NHS business. So thinking about the NHS's land and um, capital state portfolio. So here's an area where, again, it can be quite a challenge in the current context given everything we know and hear about the NHS's chronic maintenance backlog, and it can be really hard to be thinking bigger picture about value, but I've been really struck by some of the innovations we've seen in this area. And what that's looked like is um, NHS organizations thinking about the, the land and assets they have that can't be used for clinical purposes, thinking about how it can be converted into other types of community assets. So for example, we've seen in Cambridgeshire there, the community services trust um, starting a conversation with other public services. So they, they own adjacent land to the Ministry of Defense and local council. There there's a striking conversation saying, what if we combine and treated this land as one pot of public, or of public land and we took our hospital, um, rebuilt it so that it was smaller but still met community needs and then used the rest of the land to create and develop affordable housing, something that is so needed in their area. So thinking differently and having those partnerships and, and different types of conversations to see how the NHS can influence these broader community assets has been a key way we've seen um, the NHS maximize its potential here. We've also seen things kind of on the smaller scale. So for example, 
University of Hospitals of Birmingham, they were realizing, you know, a lot of community organizations in the city don't have access to meeting space, and we know the how important are for supporting social cohesion and networks in our city. So they've actually been lending meeting spaces to these community organizations on nights and weekends when they're not otherwise in use. They've been using the hospital as like free event space for these um, nonprofit and charity organizations to host their events. They've also been um, hosting kind of like free community film screenings and lecture halls on the weekend. So just thinking really creatively about how they can use their space when it's not in use to expand um, to greater community benefit. And then um, just lastly here on environmental sustainability. So there's a lot the NHS can do to change its own practices um, to, to be more sustainable. But we've been really struck by kind of organizations that have gone a step further and said, like, let's use our, our broader influence and voice to drive change in our community. Uh, so for an example there, St. Helier and Epson's Acute Trust, there they were getting lots of complaints that patients and workforce that their staff could not get to work through public transportation and they were overly reliant on cars, which is bad for the environment and bad for health in, in, in a lot of respects. So what they've done there was um, the sustainability officer looking at those complaints kind of use that as a, a way to start a conversation with the local council about piloting new on-demand bus services. There are conversations with transportation, Transport for London about extending um, London city bus services to the Surrey area to improve accessibility and, and access to reliable public transportation. So it's just a good example, I think, of how the NHS can actually use its influence as an anchor to advocate for broader assistance. Before I hand it over to Ian, just a, some quick reflections on I think how we might take this further. Uh, so I think all, of the examples I gave, what we've been really struck by is there's lots of exciting and, and innovative things happening, but rarely are they necessarily joined up as part of a cohesive, intentional strategy um, around an anchor mission. Um, so what we want to see in the next phases of work is actually how do we take it from a bunch of discrete practices to something that is mainstreamed and coordinated and joined up across the sector. And we see some, some key opportunities and actions for doing that. The report goes into much more detail, but some of the things that I just thought might pull out that could be relevant for all of you listening in today. So a lot of the change I described, those ideas all started with an understanding of kind of the baseline situation where um, organizations were starting from. So doing these internal audits to understand like what current employment practices are, what current purchasing um, practices are, and so forth. It's been a key way to like set reasonable goals and targets and then know how to shift practice accordingly. It's really hard to drive any change without knowing that baseline picture first. There's also been, uh, where we've seen places go the furthest, it's because they've had this real clear, visible leadership for it, ensuring that things like this are not seen as something extra, nice to do on top of daily roles, but a real organizational priority. And it's not only just that leadership at the board level or the more senior level that's important, it's also at every level of the organization. None of these changes have been able to take foot without engaging with the staff who are responsible for them to shape what, a, what an intervention might look like. So for example, with procurement, that has required organizations where, where they are shifting practices along social value, real conversations and training with purchasing teams about you know, how will we measure social value? What should we be looking like? How can we update our procurement processes um, and monitor in such, a, in such a way that's actually practical and realistic? It's those conversations that are essential to getting this right. Um, and then a couple more here. So I think another key enabler has been when the NHS has shared and worked with other anchors in their communities to get these things off the ground. So we've seen place-based anchor collaboratives forming in, in places like Leeds and Sheffield and Birmingham, and that's where the NHS has worked with other anchors in their community to share practice and ideas, set common goals that they can all be working towards, and they've been able to drive change much quicker and um, over the long term that way because they're working towards common goals and they're combining their collective assets and, and influence and able to make much greater progress in that way. And then lastly, um, all of these changes require, um, like with anything, real engagement and knowledge of the communities where they're based. And this is engaging with communities in different ways than the NHS has because it's not necessarily about its service delivery, it's how it can be a better 
um, community partner. So that means different types of conversations with different um, groups of people. So that's where partnerships, again, are really key in knowing where the NHS can work with others to kind of have those links into communities where they might not and know how best to structure these conversations and know really what are the, the needs, what is it going to take to narrow inequalities beyond just the delivery of the treatment and care that, that we're already doing. So um, just to close out, um, what, so the report was just a start for us and we're now at the point on the back of the long-term plan. So it was in the NHS's long-term plan that they announced that they'll be working with us to be thinking about how do we take this research now and kind of translate it into practice and continue to learn from it and do it at scale. So we're in the start of those conversations and we're really wanting to engage with as many people as possible about where more, where more support would be most helpful. So we're, we're, so we're at that phase of kind of shaping what, we, what it would look like, but just to say that the report was only the start. We want to continue to learn and understand what the impact of these different practices are, um, what, what those capability needs that we could best be serving um, through this partnership with NHS England and beyond. So just, yeah, just to please, I really uh, as possible. Um, so thank you. And now um, that's enough for me. I'll stick around for Q&A, of course, and really excited to hear from Ian about more his experience. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and we have had some great questions on the coming through on, on the system, but we're going to deal with all the questions after we've heard from Ian as well. Uh, so I'm going to now straight away introduce Ian Stenton, who is Head of Sustainability at Liverpool University Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Caroline. Hi, everybody. Um, as Caroline said, it's very recent that we became Liverpool University Hospitals Trust, so uh, my slides are a little bit out of date. Um, we merged with Aintree on the 1st of October. So last week, or last Monday, we were a large teaching trust with three hospitals, a uh, budget of £530 million and employed about 8,000 people. Now that we've merged with Aintree, that's gone up to 13,500 staff and an annual budget of around about £800 million. So as you can see, we have a massive opportunity to have a, a positive impact locally. And I'm just going to talk about some of the things that we've been doing as a trust. So Sarah's already talked through this slide, which I find incredibly useful. I have it printed out in, um, next to my desk um, in the office. And I was able to be part of the, the research looking at the NHS's anchor institution. So it was great to hear some of the work that the Health Foundation and Claire's were, were doing and to speak to other trusts and see what they were doing and what hopefully what Liverpool University Hospitals will spend the next six months um, pulling together is a, a new post-merger sustainability strategy with the NHS as an institution and this report at the key. So we'll be linking this piece of work with other local, national and international drivers such as the local industrial strategy that's been developed for Liverpool city region, some WHO work that was undertaken last year and wider to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which you'll see through most of my slides. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the five um, sections here and what we've, what we've been doing. <clears throat> Regarding employment, we have a, a well-established widening, uh, widening participation program, uh, one with the labs and one with the local university technical college. The labs one in particular um, targets people from low socioeconomic groups, people who attend schools of low progression, live in low participation neighbourhoods, black Asian and Chinese communities, and that's done very much in, in line with the Health Foundation um, findings, which is the participants are identified by Liverpool in work, who are the Liverpool City Council's employment body, job centres, schools, colleges and community groups. So we're not deciding who are the people who are um, who we should be um, working with. It's, it's decided by the experts. In addition, we have cadet programs and short work experience programs for schools. And MECA is a program that's um, being run by Liverpool Cathedral. We've been working with them with ISS, who are hotel services provider. They do 10-week programs for, um, for people further from the labour market, based around the, the cathedrals, really. And that can be for retail, for estate, uh, for catering, 
and once the um, people have finished the programme, University of Liverpool and Liverpool Philharmonic guarantee them interviews. And we're now looking at that for our hot, uh, soft FM programmes too. With regard to procurement, obviously the focus is on purchasing more locally and for social benefit. We have projects to support local business, not with much success, to, to be honest. As Sarah said, it's, it's particularly difficult because a lot of our spend is mandated. Um, we had a program with, that we developed ourselves called Sapling, which is working with smaller local businesses that we already procured from to help develop them for further public sector contracts. In Liverpool, there's something called Capacity, which is funded to do the similar thing that um, came about after the Sapling project. And that works with small SMEs and um, third sector organisations to prepare them for big public sector contracts. And again, going back to what Sarah said about using existing contracts to drive change in supply chains, we put a lot of effort into our soft FM contracts, so catering, porters, cleaners, and basing that around Liverpool CCG's social value charter at the time, so focusing on economic, social and environmental aspects, and that's one of the things that we've had a bit of success with. Something we've been working on relatively well over the last couple of years is our modern slavery statement. So um, this links to the Health Foundation aim for purchasing for social benefit. We undertook a risk assessment a couple of years ago looking particularly for high volume, low value goods and then looking at the bigger supplies for those. We contacted each of the identified suppliers and asked them to provide their modern slavery statement or confirm why they didn't have one. And one of the great pieces of feedback we got from that exercise was one of the organisations was approving their modern slavery statement at the board that week, so we could show we could help them show that there was demand for the customers that they were taking it seriously. On the back of the uh, modern slavery work, we developed sustainable procurement training, so it looks at standard economic, social, and environmental impacts, but also some of the wider health impacts of procurement. And the sustainable procurement training has been undertaken by all of our procurement staff, so we have like an IT procurement lead, a farmer procurement lead, and they were also the people that engaged directly with the suppliers regarding modern slavery because they already had the relationship rather than companies just getting an email from me and not knowing who I was. Some of the things that we looked at in the sustainable procurement training was looking at the impacts on local air quality. It's a big one for, for Liverpool and most urban areas in, in the UK. Um, looking at whether we could require environmental, socially responsible certifications with the aim to support those markets and looking at reducing toxic materials because that reduce, reduces health impacts for people who manufacture those goods or services, people in our hospital who use them and then um, as we dispose of them as well. Because of the importance of the modern slavery work, we also developed a separate ethical procurement training which covered a bit of the, the legal basics behind it and why we do that. Again, there are examples for for this, so things such as aggressive price negotiations might lead to unauthorised subcontracting. Changes made after contract mean could mean forced or excessive overtime. And short-term contracts um, lead to casualisation as organisations aren't able to invest in their equipment or the workforce. And these are was, this was a way to try and engage with procurement staff to think about the wider impacts. Obviously. Uh, anyone who's listening from the NHS will know that the vast majority of procurement work goes towards reducing the price of contracts, which is where their um, where their focus is. So I'm just trying to give them a bit more of a, a background. It's important because we already are on a lot of registers for NHS modern slavery statements. There isn't currently a requirement for the NHS to produce modern slavery statements, but you see on the left there's the modern slavery registry, which has a lot of um, NHS trusts on there. There's something called the TISC report, which we only um, put our details on relatively recently, and that lists all organisations who should have one and, and what they've done. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of risk if you, if you don't do one because people are already reporting on that. In um, September, there was a government consultation on transparency in supply chains. I just put um, the report on there. You can still view the report, although the findings haven't come out yet. And some of the aspects of that are to do with whether the public sector should become um, 
fall underneath the regulation, so it's very likely that we'll need to soon. Um, we respond, um, responded to the consultation, and we're now working in a joint post-merger modern slavery group. So Aintree and Royal and Broad Green are looking to combine our modern slavery statement. I'm also looking to work with some other local trusts as well, so I've got meetings. And the idea of that is we all use pretty much the same supply chain, so if we can work together, we actually maximise the impact upon the supply chain, but whilst limiting our um, workload. The third aspect of um, anchor institutions, capital and estate. So there's loads of great examples of this. I know Sarah touched on some. Um, I was at a, an event with Caroline last week and in the Wirral. They were talking about GPs opening the meeting rooms for community groups. We've got Incredible Edible, who are talking at NHS Forest Conference tomorrow, social prescribing, the healthy new towns, particularly around affordable and key worker housing, and the um, amazing project at Royal Stoke regarding supporting fuel poverty through solar PV on the roofs, which has won a couple of the awards. With regards to us, um, my role was created in 2014 to support the Sustainable Communities Programme for the new Royal, um, which is still still being built for those who keep up to date with um, that. The Sustainable Communities Programme was heavily based around the anchor institution model, although it was developed in 2014. So it included um, the contractors using local labour for construction workforce, supporting local supply chains, and engaging with local community. In t late 2017, we it took a full um, evaluation of that program because it was actually quite successful. Unfortunately, the, the evaluation was published the same week that Krillian went into liquidation, so didn't get much traction. And it's not really it, at the time it was definitely inappropriate to share. But we've got, a, I think, a 40-page review of that. So anyone going through big construction projects are more than happy to share that. With regards to the wider impacts, which is um, slightly bigger scale than um, what's referenced in the Health Foundation. Our chief executive at the time, particularly when the construction started, really saw the, the new Royal, not just as a world-class hospital, but to transform Liverpool economically. And for people who are based in, in this area where Caroline and I are at the moment, it's, there's really been a lot of development. And I think I'm pretty comfortable to say that the construction project for the new Royal has helped to kickstart that. So the picture on the bottom right is the Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, which should open hopefully summer next year. We have Life Sciences Accelerator on our own site. And then there's a lot of development of, um, adjacent to New Royal at Paddington, which includes the Royal College of Physicians opening the northern site. Oh, um, and that's, <laughs> that's that. Um, on a more local level, we've recently received £150,000 from Viola Environmental Trust to do some green work at Broad Green Hospital, which is amazing. Um, one of the major conditions on that piece of work was that we engage with the local community. So the funds are not to make the hospital look pretty, it's to encourage the community to access green space. So this will include growing space, which will be registered for environment, um, incredible edible, and there'll be a green, green gym on site as well, so we can engage the local community. <laughs> Regarding environmental sustainability, on obviously the energy waste and water is uh, things that all NHS trusts report on annually, and, uh, and we do too. Travel has the additional impact of local air quality Im negative impacts as well. So, as Sarah said, I think one in 20 vehicles is on NHS work or going to or from an NHS site. So it has a massive impact. And then there's procurement as well. So this can be through either um, deliveries and, again, going back to local air quality. But there's also the factor of us using our spending power to encourage environmental improvement. So although there is a Health Foundation um, separate focus for procurement, we can also use procurement to improve environmental um, production for our bigger suppliers. Within um, the Royal, so it, it hasn't been rolled out across yet, we have a sustainability impact assessment. This has either eight or ten aspects, and it does include wider um, sustainability and other aspects of the anchor institution, such as local workforce and community engagement. But the ones I've picked out here are linking more to environmental sustainability. So we're looking at energy waste and water use, use of hazardous substances, travel. And the idea is with this is when project managers are developing new projects, it just asks them to consider things such as 
if they're buying a new piece of kit, how, when are they going to write the procedures about when it can be turned off and who's in charge of that? If we are looking at providing more services in the local community, who's going to ensure that um, people are able to access those services through public transport and what, and what information do we So this is just a, a basic impact assessment that's been started to be used for, for projects just to get people to think um, a little bit wider. It follows on from the sustainable procurement um, training really. So the last section within the five health foundation anchor institution themes is partners in the place. Within um, the Royal, well, for Cheshire and Merseyside, there's the Health and Care Partnership, which has developed a social value charter, which is looking to avoid, sorry, reduce avoidable inequalities and improve health and well-being. We have a social value network meeting that the Innovation Agency and the Royal are both part of, and we're looking at how we can harmonise work across the area and promote the idea of social value and anchor institutions. Much more locally, we have a Knowledge Quarter Sustainability Network, which is co-chaired by the Royal and the two um, biggest universities. We're looking to encourage collaboration act as a forum for best practice. We've been meeting since 2014 and we have biannual meetings that are just hosted in different people's meeting rooms at no cost. We bring our own biscuits and um, no one can believe that we don't have funding, but we've been going for five years and doing relatively well. Um, Newcastle have set up a, a network based very similar on ours. Um, and the link on the bottom of the slide is to a highlights report that we published in t May 2019, um, so in this May, which showcases projects that have either been delivered, developed, or supported through the network. Um, so we, some projects we've worked together on, some or individual organisations have been doing anyway, and we've been able to um, use other partners to support that. Um, and, and some of um, there was one particularly really big funding bid that we got to the final stages for, which would have been great where the network actually instigated that work. And then lastly, you'll have seen the sustainable development goal icons throughout the slide. So um, Liverpool's the base for the 2030 hub, which is the world's first UN local 2030 hub. The 17 sustainable development goals were approved by the UN in 2015, and all, well, gov all governments are supposed to work towards 169 targets that sit underneath these goals with 2030 being the, the end date, hence the, known as the 2030 hub. We've reported on the um, SDGs for the last three years, um, and the NHS annual sustainability assessment closely links to them, so it's really easy for all NHS public health or other healthcare organisations to show how they're working towards the sustainable development goals. The assessment's just a basic yes, no, maybe questionnaire, but then at the end of it, it spews out results that will say, you are um, working towards goal seven or you're clearly con contributing to goal five. So it's really easy for trusts to report publicly on them. Um, and we're currently working with the Sustainable Development Unit on the SDG reporting. So they're looking at how, as a health sector within England, we can report on the goals. And I'm hoping to develop KPIs with our merged sustainability strategy so that we can show our progress in addition to more traditional reporting such as carbon reporting, but we can actually report for the next 10 years on what we're doing regarding quality and education or reducing inequalities and, and all that type of work. So that was a quick run through of the five key themes from a one trust perspective. So I'll hand back to Caroline. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. That's uh, fantastic. Fantastic. And to know that that was all happening because of the new hospital being built yeah. before, presumably, had you even heard the term anchor institutions when you started the role? No. Uh, uh, then it was social value or social value or corporate social responsibility. Yeah. So it's it's morphed. But I say that one slide, particularly from the Health Foundation, I think is really useful to try and explain what we're tr hoping to achieve. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Really mm -hmm. great into graphic. Um, so we have got some questions on the chat. I've got a question, first of all, Sarah, for you, which is um, you've developed this fantastic report and you've, you're really offering a framework for people to follow to become an anchor institution. Is there any kind of kite mark you're thinking of developing so that people can show that they are, they have followed the mm -hmm. concept to it, you know, in all its aspects? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I think something we're exploring in um, the next phases of the work, because I think what the challenge has been is 
So we, we help kind of identify where these areas are, but there's still a lot of work, I think, to build understanding of like what you would measure and look, look at within each of those domains with, with lots of potential. So I think we, we've been struck by um, some plate, like I mentioned a few of the anchor collaboratives, um, like those of Sheffield or Leeds or Birmingham, and we've seen those places kind of create, go a step further from a framework and, and actually define some of those metrics and start to show their own progress that we've been really um, struck by as, as an innovative example. I think we're hesitant to come up with a version that we that could work for everyone if we think local adaptation will always matter a lot here, but we are exploring how we can how we can create something or help facilitate that learning and capability so that people can understand and monitor their progress um, over time and kind of con and, and support continuous improvement in this area. So yeah, very live debate at the moment. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, so going to the first question that was logged on our chat, which is, what are the next steps for the anchor principles in local areas? So should I ask Ian to answer that one? And perhaps Sarah, you can have a think about that as well. What are the next steps for the anchor principles in local areas? Yeah, so I was contacted last week by um, someone at NHS England and Improvement regarding the next steps following on from the Health Foundation report and the concept of anchor institutions going into the long-term plan. NHS E and I are looking to work with trust on deep dives about what's exactly going on. So Leeds, which is in the report and so referenced, is part of that, and Manchester, and hopefully we'll be able to be part of that as well. So we'll have people to come in to look exactly what we're doing, um, what we can report on and record, and how that can be replicated. So for us, that would be our next step. As I say, we're also working on the Sustainable Development Goals and our strategy for the next, um, well, I'll be working on the strategy for the next six months and then hopefully it'll be a five-year strategy and anchor institutions will fit into that and the reporting of that's really important. It's something we haven't been good at previously. We've been working towards things but not being able to show the outputs. And then hopefully there's the, the work with the Health and Care Partnership, there's the Wealth and Wellbeing Programme um, that's been run by Public Health and Liverpool City Region focus not on anchor institutions but it's covering a lot of the things that we're talking about here so the findings from that will go into the local industrial strategy which again should inform our sustainability strategy so it's all tied up. Okay, Sarah any more points from you? Yeah I think um, just building on that so yeah at the national level at least I think Ian touched on it very exactly. So I think, yeah, we're at, at the report working with NHS England Improvement. We want to understand a bit better about what works and why, because I think that was one of the gaps after the report was saying there's lots happening, but really how what data exists and, and starting to evidence and, and learn from impact is still something we haven't figured out yet. So trying to just get a sense of how we would approach that with those who have been doing this um, in different ways. And then I think it's just this question of, you know, there's lots of great ideas happening, but what would it take to kind of spread and scale and embed those practices and adapt them from different contexts? What does it look like? I think we're still at a place where things are happening. They're not always connected to a sense of an anchor mission. Um, they're, they're still fairly ad hoc and discreet. So how can we get to a place where organizations like like Ian's like they're they're one of the exemplars but how how do we have to get the strategy around this and be joining up and coordinating it so it's all part of a way that the NHS envisions itself as an anchor in a community so I think these are the things that we're hoping to build on in the next phase of work so another question so it ties into that actually um, what are your views on social value assessment or return on investment tools and their use in measuring the impact of both the host organization and the contractors. Who would like to take that? Sarah, do you want to pick up? Because you kind of touched on that in that answer, didn't you? Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, and uh, Ian, I would like to know your views as well. You probably <laughs> use them more directly, actually working in the trust. But I think, I mean, my impression, I think where they exist, they've been really helpful to kind of um, help people in, in, visualize and understand and start to have those benchmarks and, and set those goals. So I think they're a really useful tool. Um, I guess I'm hesitant. Um, it just is like, it, it, only if they're used to really drive improvement and learning, I think is is the key for that. I wouldn't I'd be hesitant about 
or, or there's little questions about how do you then monitor and build accountability around social devalue, and I don't know if those tools that exist in their current forms are the best way of doing that and how we can create an environment where it's supportive and in beings of improvement and not just accountability and monitoring and enforcement. So I think those are the, the challenges there. But I, I, a real thing that I heard from teens who are trying to do this is like, we can ask for social value, we can, we can put it into a contract, but then we don't really know how to um, measure and evidence that moving forward. So I think more tools need to be created to help teens do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that's one of the quotes that's in the report that I think might have been linked to me, that we, particularly with our hotel services contract, put lots of emphasis on the sustainability, social value aspects of that, but leave, left it open to the contractors to choose what they thought they could deliver, which was a an intentional um, act. The idea would be that if one of the contractors was really great at local supply chain for catering, they could focus on there. If someone was great with apprentices, they could do there. So we weren't saying what we thought was important. We wanted to get the best out of everyone. The, the feedback from the contractors was they would have preferred us to be a lot more specific. Um, and one of the outcomes of that was that because we hadn't given so much focus onto what we wanted to achieve, we were waiting for them to come up with the innovation. We didn't have the skills or the foresight to look at how we monitor it. And that's been an ongoing problem, to be honest. So. We'd ask for lots of things, but we were not a just like Sarah said, we, we can't measure that at the moment. We did apply for some funding not too long ago to try and look at that, but um, we weren't successful with the funding. It's, it's very complicated and needs, um, needs dedicated roles to do, to be honest. One of the um, things that's come out recently on the, the Wealth and Wellbeing Programme, so the Public Health Programme, has been looking at how you can get um, social either social value from existing contracts or to use um, local suppliers. And one of the things I've raised a couple of times is that the Public Services Social Value Act sort of tells you to do that anyway. The, the group's got in a, a bit of a twist really trying to think of all these new ways to, to monitor social value. And if people stuck to the basics of what the legislation tells us to do, some of that would come out because the community groups could tell us what was important so we'd know what to measure. So I think the um, social value assessment is important because it's easy for things to drift if you're not um, not able to assess them. But like Sarah said, the ROI tools and things, they could become an industry in themselves. You need to make sure that what you're measuring or monitoring is, is relevant and, and useful. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, do you know how trusts who host community groups during evenings, et cetera, so presumably that's opening your facilities for local community groups, how they're able to fund the staffing for buildings when they're open outside office hours, that's a bit tricky, isn't it, Ian? What, what would you do? Well, this is something I've been considering, actually, because of the, um, the Anchor Institution report and how we use our, our buildings. Um, we have lecture theatres and meeting rooms, and it's not something that we currently offer, partly because it's it's so difficult for me who works for the Trusted Booking Meeting Room or the Lecture Theatre because they're always pretty busy. But for things like the evenings, I, I'm pretty sure that if we asked staff to volunteer, if it was once every three months for a couple of hours, for the benefit of, of local charities, people would be up for that. On the flip side, I am involved with a local charity who've just spent a bit of time doing up one of their meeting rooms so that they can hire it out to other groups um, as an income stream. So we'd have to be really careful that we're not supporting charities by taking things away from other groups. So it's, as with everything we'll talk about, there's two sides to the story, unfortunately, it's a bit complicated. But I, I don't know anyone who does that. With the, um, the GP example, it was just in the, my understanding was it was in the normal work and hours time. Um, but it's something that I think we could do through volunteering. I don't know, Sarah, if anyone. It's, yeah, it's not a simple answer because it depends. Yeah. Would be the answer probably, wouldn't it, on the circumstances yeah. and as you say, whether it's in gonna unfairly compete with another local asset. Do you yeah. have any views, yeah. Sarah? No, I think that's absolutely right. It's just un like ensuring that with any of these things that there aren't unintended consequences that happen as a result of them. And I think there's lots of tensions in each of the areas that need to be worked through and be very thoughtful about as like, you know, if we do more things in this way, what are those some of the impacts we might have that we're not 
fully considering. So I just think, yeah, all of that needs to be carefully considered. And yeah, in terms of, I think um, that like the the opening up of space, that was something that I think a lot of areas who are doing it, they it, it was a lot of negotiation and conversations about why it's a good thing to do and, and finding in the existing budget where there's scope to kind of shift things a bit just to allow for that capacity or having, I think there was some examples, not from Birmingham, but in some of the interviews we had where like they let school bands kind of use like a rehearsal space and it was like the school security and things that were able to just use the facilities. But all these things are negotiation. They'll look really different. They'll depend on the relationships in each place. So there isn't, again, like a one size fits all approach by any means, but I think it just hopefully it inspires ideas and thinking about what might work in different organizations given those contexts that everyone's working in. Yeah, oh, great, thank you. Um, obviously, it's going to be something that evolves in every in every site. Another question mm -hmm. here about the Liverpool University Hospital um, becoming an anchor institution specifically for economic growth in the city. Is that one of is that a deliberate aim, or is that something that may happen as a result? Um, well, I said earlier, one of the initial intentions of the redevelopment was that it would help to grow the like health and life sciences economy in in Liverpool, particularly around Knowledge Quarter, uh, which is why it was important that we built the new hospital next to the existing hospital and universities, rather than build a new out of town campus. Um, and then, so I think that that has been successful in that the investment has led to the further development of Paddington Village and some of the funds the university have done. The plan for phase two and three of development is to knock down the existing royal, which will free up space for more health or life sciences industry. And that's really key. And I think linking in with, particularly with the innovation agency and we'll have our clinical research unit there and, and there's a real drive to make sure that the hospital does help to grow the health and life sciences within within Liverpool city regions, one of the key growth areas for the, the local enterprise partnership. Um, and I think we see ourselves as having a, a, a really strong role in that. Thank you. Um, the only other question was one asking whether this is being recorded and will it be available afterwards? And the answer is yes. So um, for those who have registered, you'll get an email letting you know the link so you can go and listen and view again and we'll start promoting it in our newsletter and social media so that others can also access the recording. So, unless you've got anything else you'd like to add, Sarah and Ian? Okay. No? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and just, just to mention that we've got a conference in Liverpool tomorrow, it's the NHS Forest Annual Conference, their 10th anniversary conference, and they're having it at Older Hay Children's Hospital, which is where NHS Forest was launched. So they're, they're going back, but they're going back to a brand new hospital. It's not the same. It's the most, most amazing campus. We're going to be going out walking in the, the park, which Alder Hay do use as part of their own anchor institution um, philosophy and approach. So that's going to be an amazing event. I'm afraid it's fully sold out with a big waiting list. It's going to be, be very popular. Um, and all I can say is we will share the slides afterwards. And there's always next year's conference to look on to. So that's I think that's everything except to say thank you so much to our fantastic speakers. I'm sure you'll agree it was really interesting to hear from both Sarah and Ian. And thank you very much to everyone who's registered and attended. Thank you.